Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. Good to see you on this chilly Sunday morning. <clears throat> How many of you saw the news this week about the, uh, the guy who stole the modular house from Harrisonburg area? Anybody see that? You didn't see this. Okay, that's good. I've got some pictures. Um, this really happened. So I, 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 this isn't the joke part. Like, I'm going to make a joke out of it, but this really happened. So in Harrisonburg, a guy with a, uh, I guess like a flatbed truck um, comes in and there's a modular house that's on a trailer and he steals it. And like looking at this picture, like it's a security camera and like the guy has some moxie because it's like daylight out. Yeah, he still steals a house and he was able to evade the police for like days. Um, I guess the reason that they found him is because he was like taking this house down a narrow backcountry road and hit several mailboxes. And the people reported it, and they followed up, and he had taken this and parked it up in some field somewhere. So real life story, they finally caught him after days of evading the police. But it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? Like, what do you do when somebody steals a modular home and they're arrested? Like, do you put them on house arrest? And what do you charge them with? Like, is this a moving violation? And yet, you know, it, it's also baseball season. So I started wondering, like, can we just say this guy got caught stealing home? <laughs> All right, maybe I should live with that one. <laughs> so real live event, um, strange event, but they did finally catch the guy. Someone had written, like, in a Facebook post, like, um, they found out this guy had stolen a number of things. He stole, like, a, a skid loader and some other uh, large items. He came from Michigan, and someone said he's a professional thief. And I'm like... <laughs> I guess he did pretty well. I've never stolen a house before, but um, anyway, that, it was pretty gutsy. Who steals a house? Oh. Anyway, that has nothing to do with our sermon today. I just found it rather interesting. <laughs> today we are continuing our sermon series on the essentials of the church. We've been asking, what will the church look like post-COVID? What do we need to hold on to? What is like biblical foundations of the church? And, and what is more cultural? And if it's cultural, we can adapt things. We can leave it out. We can change them along the way. So, so far we've looked at these things. We've looked at what we wear and we've looked at what we say. We're saying there's a lot of cultural things there that dictate what we wear for clothing and how we speak to one another, both inside and outside of the church. Very flexible there on what we do. But today we're going to look at grace. And I want to say that grace is something that we cannot give up on. The church needs grace. If church stopped giving grace, offering grace, extending grace, receiving grace, we would fail to be the church. So what I want to do today is I want to walk you through some ideas about what grace is and what grace is not. And I love that passage that Danny read for us from, from Matthew. I think it's such a good reminder of how important it is not only to receive grace, but to give grace as well. And it's not necessarily easy, but it is biblical. Okay, well, I want to start by going back to a book that I've, I've probably mentioned many times so far. It's a book that I read. Um, it's one of those things, like, you think you know how many years ago, you probably should double how far ago it was. It, was, it feels like it's been probably 15 years ago, so it's probably um, at least 20 years ago, this book that Philip Yancey wrote. It's called What's So Amazing About Grace. Are you familiar with this book? Uh, actually, I looked it up. It was written in 1997. And one of the chapters, Yancey just starts laying out these different understandings of grace, these different ways that we use the word grace, because it's a really broadly used word. Here's a few of the examples from 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 Yancey, and also a few of my own kind of mixed in. If you like some of them, those are probably Yancey's. If they look stupid, that's probably <laughs> my own. Uh, but we're talking about grace, so you have to be kind to me. No. <laughs> Here's some of the ways that we use the word grace. Many people will sit down to a family meal, and you have this time to sit around the table, and you stop, and you pause, and you have this pre-meal blessing. Sometimes people will refer to it as saying grace. Or how about we watch a, an ice skater moving across the, the ice like smoothly and elegantly, and, and you look at that individual and you say, she moves with grace. 
my, my niece is, is um, named Grace, and my dad used to laugh every time she would fall over. She fell over a lot as a child. <laughs> my dad used to joke around and say, that's why we call her Grace. <laughs> I've been reading some of the church fathers recently. Uh, we sometimes refer to them as the patristics. Um, patristic is simply the Latin word for, for father. Um, so from the, the period like post-apostolic, uh, post-apostles through the mid-5th century, we have this group of church fathers that wrote a lot and gave formation to the church and the church doctrines. And, and these church fathers, the patristics, they talk about the giving of the Torah in the Old Testament. They call the giving of the Torah a grace. They talk about the arrival of Christ here on earth as a grace. They talk about the New Testament, the, the giving of the New Testament as a grace. And some will even talk about life itself, the fact that God gives us the breath that's in our lungs. They say that is a grace. Some of you might hear this word gratis from time to time. If somebody does something for you absolutely free, uh, gratis is the Latin word for, for grace. Um, they do something gratis. Um, uh, maybe, you know, Glenn might come over and check out your, your plumbing in your house because you've got a leak and, and he doesn't charge you anything for that. He's done that for you gratis. Sometimes we refer to a tip that somebody puts on a, a um, check, like you go to a restaurant, you get your meal and they have that spot. Like it's, it seems like it's everywhere now. Whenever you use your credit card, you have an opportunity to leave some gratuity. You see the same root there as grace. And we all know that Garth Brooks himself is not big on social graces. I know you're listening now. Who? I actually listened to that song this morning. I'm sure Sonia wonders sometimes. That's why it was in his head. And of course, we as a, a Protestant church were built upon some of the teachings of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther had this concept that he drew from, from scriptures. He referred to it as sola gratia. Everybody say sola gratia. sola gratia. That is Latin, and it means by grace alone. You see the sola and the gratia there. And he drew that from places like Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So the idea of salvation by solo gratia, the salvation by grace alone. And I know that I often get up here and I talk about ethics and I talk about theology. And I just want to go on the record one more time to say I do believe that salvation is by grace alone. So when I get up here and I talk about things about how we should live, don't ever hear me saying, you know, preaching about works ethics or, or, or sorry, works salvation or something like that. I believe in works faithfulness, not works righteousness. So let's go back to that list. I should have put another version here, but I'll go backwards instead. And we look at just some of the, the, the depth and the vast of the use of this word. We go everything from a, a pre-meal blessing of our food to this elegant movement by this figure skater all the way to salvation by grace alone. So every now and then it's really good for us just to step back a bit and say, what does this word actually mean? And the word grace simply means an unmerited gift. This is something that you did not earn. John Willis, you did not work hard enough to receive this grace. I see your eye contact back there. <laughs> you didn't do enough work to earn this. You didn't earn it yourself. It is simply a gift that is given to you. Now, we all know what it's like to give, give, get, get gifts, right? I, I hope you've received a gift at some point. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> On your birthday, you got gifts. <laughs> So, but you know what it's like, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but sometimes we, we, we think about these gifts that people get. Say you've been working at your job for 25 years, and they give you um, some sort of a gift, like, uh, I, I don't know, you get um, Ginsu knives or something like that after 25 years of working. Or, or maybe you get a Christmas bonus. You know, your, your boss might give you a membership to the Cheese of the Month um, company or organization, whatever that might be, the club. <laughs> Um, but, but looking at these examples of gifts, I want to say that, that is, that's not grace. Because that's, that's a reward for 
25 years of service or, or a reward for really good work. You have earned that. That's recognition of the time and the energy that you have put in. And I would even want to walk back a little bit when people talk about leaving a tip at a restaurant to call that gratuity because how do we give somebody a tip? Well, if they really do a good job, you tend to tip better. If they do a really poor job, if there's a fly in your soup and they spill your water on you as they bring it to the table, um, you're probably not going to reward them quite the same. So to call that grace, to call that gratuity, maybe doesn't really apply. Unless that person that spills the water and, and leaves the fly in your soup, unless you like, give them a really good tip, you know, then that would be grace. That is an unmerited gift. So we begin to see just what's going on here. When we talk about people saying grace before a meal, what they're doing is they're pausing a second. They're saying, yes, I have worked. I have earned money to buy this food. I have worked to prepare this food and I put it on the table. But yet we're still recognizing, I can't make that seed grow into a head of wheat. I can't make that seed grow into a tomato on my own. I can't make this legume grow out of the ground. When we stop to say grace before a meal, it's realizing that God has given us something and we don't deserve it. We did nothing to earn it. When we look at that figure skater moving across the ice, you know, it's, we're saying, yeah, my elbows move like that. And my shoulders rotate, not quite as round as they used to, but and my, my body still moves. But there's something about the way that person moves. They move in a way that I cannot, and maybe most people cannot. It's a recognition of their God-given gift. They did nothing to earn that. They were born in that way. And when we talk about grace as God's forgiveness and our forgiveness of others, it's a realization that we did nothing to earn that gift. We didn't earn God forgiving us. What did you do to make God forgive you? Oh, oh, oh yeah, no, it, it was just a gift. Grace is unmerited. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, and we're going to see a few issues that I actually have with how I interpret grace based on this. <laughs> so pay attention and see where I'm, if you can guess where I'm going to go, um, because there's some challenges here. So the story begins with Peter, and we love Peter because Peter preaches well. <laughs> Peter's always shooting off at the mouth, saying silly things, and, and it really makes like a good object lesson for, for sermons. Um, so Peter is there. He wants to show off a little bit for Jesus, and he asks one of those questions where he actually suggests an answer to him, thinking that his answer is going to be superior. Peter asks Jesus, he says, Lord, how many times shall I forget my brother or sister who has sinned against me? And he offers like this number, thinking it's really like a huge, you know, huge uh, gesture of, of grace on his part. He says, should I forgive my brother or sister up to seven times? He's expecting that attaboy. <laughs> Good job, Peter. But Jesus responds, he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And if you know this passage well, you know that that can actually be flipped around and read differently um, it could be read not seven times, but 70 times seven for a total of 490 times. Yes, I did the math in advance. <laughs> and the thing is that in Greek, the word order isn't as important as it is in English. So it's a little confusing as to which word came first, the chicken or the egg there um, kind of scenario. Um, but the point really isn't whether it's 70 times or 77 times or 490 times. The point is Peter you are way undershooting it, like way underestimating. You are so far off. Seven times, well, maybe that's a, a nice start, but you know what? Multiply that times 70, and then you're getting in the right ballpark. So to illustrate this, Jesus tells this parable. He tells about this man who owes a lot of money. <laughs> this guy, he's made some seriously bad decisions with his finances. Does that relate to anybody here? Don't say it. No. <laughs> Can I get an amen? No. <laughs> okay, but just to get an idea how bad this is, um, this guy, it says in the text that he owed the man, I think it said in the NIV, um, 10,000 bags of gold. 
In the original Greek, it says 10,000 talents. And the reason it says 10,000 bags of gold in the NIV is because no one knows how much a talent is. Well, a talent is about 20 years worth of labor, like the wages for 20 years worth of labor. And again, I did the math ahead of time just to make sure I got all the zeros right. That comes out to 200,000 years worth of labor. Yeah, well, how do you even get that far in debt? Like this is, this is like eligible for squid games kind of debt right here. Two people got it, all right. <laughs> Cultural references. Um, so this guy is really like, there's no way he can actually pay this off. He, he owes the king this money, he goes to the king, and, and the king's like, well, because you can't pay this off, I'm gonna take you, your wife, and your children, and I'm going to sell you into servitude to help, off, help offset some of this debt. And the guy is not happy about that. So he begins to beg and plead. And the king says, okay, I forgive you. I forgive you of what would be like millions of dollars of debt. And no, he doesn't say, well, I'll let you refinance at a lower interest rate. <laughs> he doesn't say, I'll, I'll give you a few extra years to pay it off. He, it's just nothing. You are debt free. Who would like to be in that position? <laughs> but here's the weird, like that's, that's, that's amazing right there. But then the guy goes out of the king's court and he sees somebody else who owes him money. And he approaches that guy and he demands that that guy pays him money. And that guy owed him, it says in the Bible, it says 100 denarii in the, in the, in the Greek. And a denarius, that's a single ver, singular version, is denarius. Denarius is equal to one day of labor. So it's not nothing that the guy owes, and it's not trivial. It's like five months worth of work. Like close to half of your yearly salary, this guy owed. But rather than forgive this guy, he throws him into debtor's prison, where he would have to work off his debt. And that person would collect whatever wages that guy earned. So you see this, this juxtaposition of these two individuals. The king forgave what is this insurmountable, incomprehensible, huge amount of money. And the other guy, again, he goes out and he's not willing to forgive somebody who owes significantly less. And the point seems to be, look at how much, how gracious, how good God has given, um, forgiven us for all the things that we owe him. Aren't we then to also forgive others? And in this story, the king is so angry, he throws that other guy, the first servant, in prison as well. So here's where I have some issues with this passage. God's forgiveness seems to be contingent upon forgiving others. And on one hand, I actually like that idea. I mean, I like that God requires that we forgive other people in order for us to be forgiven. Maybe that's a little more motivation for us to start forgiving one another. So part of me really likes that. The part that doesn't like that is, that's not really grace then, is it? Because I was talking about how, <laughs> I know, I, I dug myself in that hole. I was talking about how if, if, um, if there's anything that you do to earn it or, or, or merit that, it's, it's not grace. Well, if you have to forgive someone else in order to receive this, isn't that kind of the same thing? And I think the reason that this is so confusing, and it's, it's, it's an error on our part as the interpreter of the text, because I think one of the problems that we have is when we read the parables, we assume that all of our theology can kind of fit into these, these stories. And what we need to do instead is to read it for the main point. What was the point of this? The rest is kind of supporting information. And the point that he's trying to make is he's responding to Peter, who said, how many times do I have to forgive this person? And he's responding to Peter's Peter's uh, understanding that seven times is, is sufficient. So what he's trying to do, again, is compare and contrast how much God has forgiven us and calling us to forgive likewise. So it's still a little bit of a stumbling block, but it's not quite as bad as, as what I originally thought it was. But my really big problem with this one is I tend to be a lot more like the unforgiving servant. And I don't think I'm alone. And I'm not looking at anybody here in particular. It's one of those times I'll, I'll look down at the carpet. I'm not accusing anybody here. But it has been my experience that Christians are sometimes the least likely to extend 
grace to others. And just five minutes ago, we talked about how, how part of our tradition as Protestants is that we understand salvation by grace alone. Solo gratia. We even said that word together, the, the Latin. <laughs> I tricked you into saying it. No. But here it is in my simplified version. I say that those who profess salvation by grace alone are often the least likely to extend grace to others. So hold that in the back of your mind. Sit with that for a minute. We're going to tell a few more stories and we're going to come back around to it. All right, so a couple years ago, I picked up a book by a scholar of religion named Philip Ivanhoe. And the brilliant guy writes really well, um, really easy to read. But Ivanhoe talks about spontaneity. And he says that spontaneity in many cultures is a virtue which makes me a little nervous because I'm not a spontaneous person. <laughs> like, it takes me like six months to figure out what kind of car I want to buy next whenever it's time to buy a car. And, you know, even something as simple as choosing what I want to eat on my birthday. You know, it's like, oh, man, I only get to do this once a year. <laughs> and I can't decide, do I want the pizza or do I want the lasagna? Um, do I have to choose between them? Um, I'm not a spontaneous person. I tend to drag my feet. I want to know my options. I want to think it through. Um, you put me in a place where I have to make a decision right here and now, and I start panicking a little bit. But when Ivanhoe's talking about spontaneity as being a virtue, he's not talking about choosing what you want for your birthday meal or buying your next car even, something as big as, a, big as an investment as that. He's talking about our ethics. He's saying that spontaneity in choosing what is right and wrong shows what's really under your skin. Here's a direct quote from Ivanhoe. He says this. He says, Spontaneity is regarded as a mark of authenticity and honesty. The immediate response is thought to reveal how we really feel. So I have an example of this. <laughs> um, about the time I was reading this book, I was, uh, oh, you're not supposed to see that one yet. Um, about the time I was reading this book, um, I was going for a run, and it was out in the country, and I was um, struggling. It was springtime of the year. It's been winter. You know, you got the extra winter weight and all that, which I have now carried around year-round. But anyways, you, you got the extra pounds from Christmas, and, and, and struggling. The weather's just getting nice enough. I'm out running in the country, and my wife and children drive past me one day while I'm running. <laughs> That wasn't the joke, all right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm running, they drive past me, and when I get home, I decide to text my wife. I said, so tell me the truth. Did I look slow and pathetic to you? And she responds, you didn't look pathetic at all. And I respond, so I just look slow. That was her immediate response, like spontaneity. She didn't have time to think that through. She was just like, oh, you didn't look pathetic. That's fine. I, I'm, I'm overthinking that. But you see what I'm trying to say. Someone's immediate response. You didn't have time to think about it. Whatever you do immediately, Ivanhoe is saying, reveals what's really under your skin, who you really are. Now, he also goes on to describe two different kinds of spontaneity. And if you saw the screen just a moment ago, you know what they are. He calls them cultivated and uncultivated spontaneity. Uncultivated spontaneity are the things that are almost universal. You don't have to do anything. This is just the way you are and most people are. And the example that he uses is if you are walking through a village and you see a young child playing around a well and that person falls into the well, what are most people going to do? What is everybody but John going to do? <laughs> You're going to do something to help that child, right? You, you throw them a rope, you climb down there, you find some help, somebody that can do something. It is like universal. Um, everybody here but John will, <laughs> will try to help that child. So you didn't have to think about that, did you? Like that, your immediate response is, let's run to this well. Um, even if it's to drop the rock in there. <laughs> your immediate response is to go and do something to help. That is uncultivated. But we also have cultivated responses. And he uses the example of shaking hands. 
Now, in the United States, it's common whenever you go to somebody who you have known for a while or you're just meeting them for the first time, what do you do? I'll engage Hadley here for a minute. What do you do when you see somebody? You <laughs> shake their hand, right? That's, 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 or you can say, hey, that's fine. But, but you weren't born with that, were you? Like, itty bitty baby doesn't come out of the womb. Hi, mama, daddy. Oh. <laughs> it's something that you learn over time. And then after a while, it becomes such a part of who you are. When you see somebody you know out in public, what do you do? You extend your hand to them and shake hands. And I think that the, the pandemic, you know, when we stop shaking hands, shows how hard it is to break those cultivated actions sometimes. You know, in the midst of the pandemic, when it was at its worst, we weren't shaking hands at all. You know, you, you, you went from the fist bump to, to just nodding, to just saying, hey. It's so awkward because we have been culturally um, cultivated to shaking hands. So now let's apply that to our topic for today. What about grace? Would you say forgiving people is cultivated or uncultivated? Is it natural to forgive people? I, I, I don't think it's natural, right? No, because think about a baby. Again, think about this child building with their blocks in the nursery. They're, they're, they're building this tower, and some other child comes along, and they take some of those blocks. Does the child, yeah, does the child naturally say, I forgive you? <laughs> no. What does the child do? They take their blocks, right? Or they hit their, they knock their block off. Or <laughs> it often results in violence or tears or crying. Um, often they go to the, the parent or the teacher involved and they tell on that person. It is not natural for that child to offer grace and forgiveness. But just because it's not natural, just because it doesn't come to us uncultivated, doesn't mean that it's not biblical. And forgiveness is very biblical. It's not just this passage from Matthew, from Matthew 18. Time and time again, we find places in the Bible where it says we must forgive others, just as God has forgiven us. So we are called to cultivate that virtue, to cultivate the virtue of grace and forgiveness. So for me, in my mind, that means forgiving people over the small stuff. The small stuff that really doesn't affect anyone. You know, you know, something like somebody cuts you off on the road, on driving the interstate. We have to forgive that person. You see somebody drop some litter in your yard, and what do you do? You throw it away, and then you forgive them. You, you, your kicker on your football team misses the winning field goal. What do you do? You... <laughs> We're going to have to have some one-on-one -on -one sessions here, John. <laughs> I was going for you, you forgive them. And we can, we, we, we can joke around with this because, you know, these things really don't matter. Like, it's, it's small stuff. Somebody cuts you off. If nobody was hurt, um, somebody throws a little garbage. That's not cool, but yet I can still pick it up. Um, somebody misses a field goal. It doesn't really affect my life one way or the other. But the point is that these are teaching us to do something. This is teaching us to become the kinds of people who naturally forgive. This is our cultivation of this specific virtue. We forgive the small stuff, so when the big things arise, that we can forgive them as well. Now, many people here, when I start talking about forgiveness and the, the naturalness of it, immediately turn back in our memories to the story of the Amish school shooting in Pennsylvania. And it serves as a wonderful example of this. We know this story, and it's the story of, of, of Charles Roberts, and Roberts shows up at this, this, this one-room schoolhouse one day in October, and he barricades the doors, and he shoots 10 different students. Five of them die immediately on the scene or soon after, and then he turns the gun on himself. These students will be adults today. That's happened 15 years ago this month. Can you believe that? 15 years ago. And this was all over the news because the story itself is so atrocious, so horrible, horrendous. The stuff of nightmare. There's this peaceful, small sectarian group being picked on and, and, and targeted in such a way. But I think what caught most people's attention was what happened in the days and the weeks following that event. 
because we then saw pictures emerge of, of Amish people embracing the parents of Charles Roberts. There's actually a picture of an Amish elder hugging Robert's father as he mourns, as they cry together. And we hear stories about how the Amish community reached out to the rest of the family. They started funds for the children of Charles Roberts. They showed up at his parents' home, at his wife's home, with food and gifts for them. And then in the days to come, we, we hear about this public act of forgiveness. The people, the Amish community, forgiving this family. Forgiving the man that killed their children. Now, so many people pushed back on them and said, you know, that's, that's not right. <laughs> you can't forgive like that. And, and people said, it's too soon. And can it, be, can it be legitimate? Or are they just trying to draw attention to themselves? Um, and I think some of those questions are fair. It's okay to ask those questions. But I think the point that I'm trying to make this morning is that, no, it doesn't make sense outside of that community. Because so much of the world is like those children that when you steal their block, the natural response is to steal the blocks back. You know, in the nursery world, it's, it's an eye for an eye and a baby tooth for a baby tooth. And we, if we don't do something about it, we'll grow up with that same mentality. But for this Amish community where that was a part of the water they drink and the air that they breathe, this maybe wasn't natural at first, but it soon became a part of who they are, a part of who they want to be. It doesn't make sense outside of this community of believers, but for the people that are inside that know the importance of forgiveness, it becomes a cultivated virtue that when something major happens, the natural response is to forgive. Now, when I talk about forgiveness, I always need to kind of give my, my warnings as well. Because as much as I think forgiveness is a part of the Bible, and, and we've agreed, right? This is very biblical. The phrase forgive and forget is not in the Bible. No, no. So I, I think, for instance, um, we have wonderful treasurers here, but imagine somebody steals money from the treasury. You forgive that person, but you don't necessarily put them in charge of the books, right? <laughs> And somebody is, is a, a, an abusive spouse, you know, you might forgive that person, but it doesn't mean that you don't go seek help in that situation. So forgiveness is very much a biblical concept. Forgive and forget, not so much. Forgive and grow. Forgive and love. Forgive and seek the help of others, but not forgive or forget. So I want to end this morning by asking you all one question. What did Charles Roberts do to deserve the forgiveness of the Amish community? Nothing. He couldn't. He was already gone. He's already dead. And we could expand that. What did the family of Charles Roberts do to, to deserve the forgiveness of the Amish community? They did nothing either. This is grace. Grace is a gift that we do not earn a gift that we do not deserve. It is an unmerited gift. Now, we as the church, moving forward in this, what will eventually be a post-pandemic world, I think must hold on to grace with the tightest hands possible. We want to hold on to that because we cannot let this go. It doesn't look right. It doesn't look normal to the rest of the watching world. But for us, it is a part of who we are. And even though it is, according to my observation, that, that the people that believe that salvation is by grace and grace alone are the least likely to extend it to the, uh, to the others, what if we actually practiced what we preach? Maybe, just maybe, the church could truly be an agency of change for the rest of the world. May it be so, and amen. I've selected a hymn of response this morning that will be familiar to 